Voice of the World, March 20th, 2020. Let's have a discussion. Why do I read news in other languages? I don't always read the news, but when I do, I read news in many languages, not just the ones I can read out loud. For example, I can read Japanese very well and understand all kanji, even if I don't know its correct pronunciation. So Japanese is also a frequent news source for me. So I tend to just kind of read the, um, the pulse of the world from, from all over the world, no matter what language it's in. But the reason why we read the news in the source language is to avoid filters and the effects of projecting one's own cultural norms on the original message, which may happen by those who rewrite that news. The source language also makes a lot of cultural references that don't normally translate well anyway. Over time, you get acquainted with these cultural references and you're literally able to understand the world from a completely different reality and perspective. But it takes time, lots of exposure, and lots of practice. But when you achieve this, you really start to see the short-sightedness of everybody living in their own cultural bubbles or their own countries, and there's this systemic myopia all over the world. It's not just about solving the language problem and asking everybody to speak the same language, because I'm still appalled that the U.S., despite this, still has lots of strife and myopia between people speaking the same language. The fact is, we're all human, and we're more alike than you can imagine. We all have the same needs, desires, emotions, everything, and we share the same earth and the same sky. And um, more importantly, we have the same bodies, the same symptoms and ailments, and the same illnesses. Our hospitals are not divided into political wards, for example. First glance at the news today is very grim. All the measures taken in Italy two weeks ago to hold the spreading of the virus or arrest that spread have not come to fruition. An Italian posted on YouTube a typical obituary page in their local paper from February, and the obituary from yesterday, which ran for 10 pages. And it's even more distressing to see all the pictures posted in that obituary. And that just makes this very real for everybody. You can view that video by searching for Coronavirus 10 Pagini, uh, 10 Pagine di Necrologi sull'Eco di Bergamo. Putin of Russia, on the other hand, is saying that they've done a good job to keep the virus out. But let's face it, Russia is one of those countries where it's historically been difficult to get into and get out of. The number of cases in my country is now following a very similar pattern to that of Germany's on February 28th to March 1st. Although that's a very small window in, of numbers, if we see a rise of 40 or more cases today, here, then we are definitely on that course, and we could possibly be at Germany's numbers of 15,000 in 20 days from now. On Monday of this week, I posted on Facebook. I've only logged on a handful of times in the last couple of years, so I very rarely post. I didn't post my statement to any of the Glossica pages because this is a personal message that I believe to be true. Um, but it is not backed by science. And I'd like to repeat that message now. And I repeat, this is not backed by science. But I, I think it is what I believe to be good behavior in time of crisis. So due to the gestation period of this virus, because basically it attaches to one cell, multiplies, then goes to the next. It spreads in the body very much like how it spreads in a population. Meaning you don't know it's there until it's already infected too much of you. What I'm saying is that we're all potential infected carriers of this virus. People are saying that Trump has been in contact with people who have tested positive, and some are joking it's the only positive to come out of mar lago for that matter. More importantly, we should be treating him as infected just because of the way this virus works. The virus is so microscopically small, it just floats in the air around us and hangs onto your clothes fibers until you brush something, then move some of those particles to wipe your, your eyes or your nose, especially don't use your hands, you know, and because that's where it has a chance to grab hold of your cells. From a social distancing point of view and not a healthcare professional's point of view, we need to treat everybody as infected. We're all carriers and we may continue to be carriers without showing symptoms because we're healthy or because of our age group. Or let's look at it another way. Let's say you suffer from diabetes and a little girl got infected at school, uh, your little girl uh, got infected at school or she's been out with friends and comes home spreading the virus around. Because of her health levels and age, she's completely safe from this virus. But now you've got the virus coupled with your diabetes, which is known as a comorbidity, not to intentionally shock you, but you could be potentially dead in two weeks. 
And this is why they're stressing you should not have any face-to-face -face or close contact with elderly, even if you're healthy. Or even your community, your co-civilians, your co-countrymen, or co-earthlings, anybody who has health issues. And the truth is everybody has health issues. In a normal situation, we're all aging a year at a time, closer to our deathbed. But there's no need to speed that process up for someone else. I'd like to comment that if you are a healthy person, you are still at great risk. I'm quoting here from an El País article titled, Muere el primer guardia civil por coronavirus. Pedro Alameda, de 37 años, no tenía patologías previas. What this means is that a 37-year-old Spanish civil guard with no underlying health conditions has died of coronavirus. Now, I've been interested in the Persian language news coming out of Iran as well, but let's just say that I'm not really comfortable with relaying that news in a public forum here for the same reasons I don't discuss the news coming out of China. I always behave uh, by the maxim, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, but I maintain that no matter where I am, so I don't get involved with others' politics. There are two kinds of sources of news in the Persian language, and Iranian censors like the Chinese are very tough. It suffices for us to know that there are two truths in the world, and let's leave it at that. One truth is what people are thinking, and the other truth is what is allowed to be said out loud or published. You can continue thinking what, uh, what you want as long as you don't express that out loud. If you want to check local news in Iran, and you know what I mean by local, go to iribnews.ir, and that's I-R-I-B news.ir and if you want expat Persian news and now you know what I mean by that you can go to tasnimnews.com that's t-a-s-n-i-m news.com I'm interested in the economic consequences of what's going on in the world a lot of companies are getting forced into remote working scenarios and those that can definitely should because they'll maintain competitive advantage unfortunately a lot of research and development is getting disrupted where people need to work in labs or with special machinery. Not to mention the fiscal impact, because if you're not using a physical space and then rent is due, what's going to happen is a massive economic implosion of office space and renting. When it comes to being productive, time is our worst enemy. That and a pandemic, obviously. So when the next month comes and rent is due on properties that are not being used, what's going to happen? What about the people not getting paid? How long can this be sustained? What if even a portion, say 20% of companies come out and say, we no longer need office space because we figured out remote, cutting costs. Uh, but for the employees, that cuts the need for commute, freeing up more productive time in a day and more quality time with the family. In fact, wouldn't it be great if you just didn't have to live in that expensive area anymore? What if you could live far, far away and still do top quality work for that company? What I'm saying is that there's going to be a big knock-on effect on property prices. And rents. Let's face it, landowners are the real winners in places like Silicon Valley. All they have to do is wait for the clock to tick down to the next month and your business has to pay up and they honestly don't care how much you struggle to make your business work. A big portion of revenues of tech giants in Silicon Valley go to these landowners. When Dropbox went public a couple years ago, their S1 stated despite their intention to build their own office building, they were contractually bound to their current office rent at a cost of more than half a billion dollars. I don't remember the exact figures, but going forward almost a decade into the future, whoever the landlord is, is making half a billion dollars in less than 10 years from a major tech company. Does that landlord have to worry about whether that money is going to come in or not? Not really. He only needs to worry about his golf swing. Golf swing. But it will be interesting to see if things in this area start to change. My own cost of living, including my rent, is at all-time lows, just under 1,500 US dollars per month. And my cost of living is only this high, primarily because I'm paying pretty high rent in the middle of a major city. Even my food budget this year has already been cut in half as I scale back due to the crisis. A $300 purchase of meat, veggies, and carbs gives me two months of supplies now. If I had to move house to cut costs, I would cut my spending by more than half. I pay approximately $60 per year for universal health care coverage. I just don't have any other expenses. I'm working to digitize all these books behind me so that I can get down to minimal possessions as possible. I've never owned a TV or sofa, so I probably won't change my habits with that either. I do own a grand piano though, um, so you can 
kind of see that right over there. Um, and since January 1st of this year, I've stopped taking public transport and taxis, so now I simply walk everywhere and enjoy the time listening to language or podcasts. It's great exercise because in January I walked over 200 kilometers, obviously much less now though. Due to this uh, amount of minimalism, I do have space in my budget to enjoy paying for subscriptions, whether that's Netflix or other services I really like. So I'm at a point where I can really enjoy all the good things on a very low budget. So let's talk about some more knock-on effects. Since most of the world is locked in at home, I hope that people are spending more time reading books and writing books. Maybe you're a musician, so you create more music or add to your repertoire. Maybe you're a developer and you finally have time to start mastering machine learning or that code you haven't had time to learn. Or maybe you finally have time to work on learning languages, which I strongly recommend because it really has so many benefits. If you want to learn how to learn better, I recommend following Scott Young. Like I said at the beginning, learning more languages allows us to listen and tune in to other people's realities. But more than that, you can engage with people from different backgrounds and it may have a knock-on effect on your career, landing you more valuable career prospects. Let's say you know Spanish, but you haven't mastered it, but you consume a lot of Spanish media. Well, you may have an advantage in a marketing position overseeing larger markets because you understand a lot of the nuances of the cultures. There are positions out there called Asian Regional Director or Latin American Regional Director with very good paying salaries, and most of these roles come from a deep understanding of the region and languages, an ability to communicate with local communities. This year, I expect to see a lot of productivity and a massive boost in creativity. Another kind of productivity is babies. We should see the declines in birth rates across the world rebound by early next year. And these are all blessings in disguise at this point in time. In the last few years, online retailers like Amazon have only grabbed 5% of the whole retail market. And I'm working with numbers published specifically to the US here, which has about 50% of online sales. But we can't really call online a market because online is just a medium. So we can estimate that online retail is 10% of all retail. With more and more people switching to online purchasing, and why do you need to risk going to the market anyway? I'm optimistic that a lot of the retail market will start shifting to online, so that 10% may double or triple by the end of the year. Some of that will be going to Amazon and the rest to others like Walmart and other players. But either way, we could potentially be seeing doubling or tripling of revenue at companies like Amazon. If the stock price is off all-time highs, then perhaps you can get it at a big discount now before quarterly earnings come out in about a month and you're too late to get that discount. So right now, looking back on the years 2001 to 2020, these years feel like some kind of a forced holdout on the 20th century way of doing things, while at the same time we've seen major progress in ways of doing business like the Amazons and the Teslas of the world. And now moving forward from 2020, I believe we're experiencing a major shift, shifting point in history where this marks the end of one era and the beginning of a new era. This new era is the true 21st century with dispersed workforces, less reliance on commute, scaling down a massive concrete infrastructures, which you know, support that commute, uh, more space for nature, less reliance on oil, if not completely eliminating it, or at least everything going to electric, uh, the rapid growth of robotics and VR. And some of this reminds me of a 2009 movie starring Bruce Willis called Surrogates. If you have some time to spend this weekend, you could perhaps watch it. If you want to get to know me more, my primary interests are in how to enhance our bodies, make them stronger, and make education more efficient and apply that to any new skill or knowledge. My interests extend to how we create superhumans in the future from mental capacity to biological capacity. So I'm actively engaged with everything related to food, nutrition, exercise, and longevity. For most of 2019, I ran 20 kilometers, I'm sorry, 10 kilometers every morning, uh, which takes around 50 minutes or so. And I ran the Taipei City Half Marathon in December, but it's a trade-off with time. So this year I'm running less. I'm doing more indoor calisthenics and focusing more on language and mental, uh, mental capacity. So here at Glossica, we're starting with language and how we acquire language as a skill and building out the infrastructure so that we can tackle human knowledge in general because language is at the core of human knowledge and intelligence. Now this is a big undertaking and requires us to expand the depth of all the content we provide in every language. So we need really strong syntactic and semantic analyzation tools or analyzing tools. 
And so we do this by breaking all concepts down into their smallest unique elements, like you have with the table of elements. Then by grouping elements together, much like you would a, a molecule, um, we rebuild a complete understanding of all human knowledge, which is a massive undertaking on solving issues in machine learning regar regarding multi-word expressions, their unique concepts, and the elements that make them up. In turn, we improve lang language learning as well. By understanding all the underlying elements, we're able to permute those patterns into an education system to determine what a student already knows or doesn't know and provide a custom-built permutation for that student. In other words, we're really tackling education as a whole, starting with a super deep understanding of human knowledge and the language interface. We invite anybody who's interested in getting involved to send an email to hr at glossica.com. And what we found is that currently tagged language data sets that exist are severely lacking for this kind of understanding. I believe that all failures in the current state of AI has nothing to do with the algorithms, which are already very advanced, whether you're using LSTM, CNNs, RNNs, what have you. Because the AI algorithms are like medicine pills. They're only therapeutic and do not address the symptoms or problems that exist in the original training data. So we're in the process of training our own machine learning tagging system to tackle all the other data sets so that we can re-tag everything in the training data sets and scale that out across languages. At this point, it's really important to build more gamified crowdsource solutions to ensure the quality and integrity of the data. And so regarding the current crisis, here's an idea. A lot of people are probably already thinking about this and working on it. I really don't know, but I believe there must be a way to train an AI system to identify harmful viruses and start working on cracking the code to build antigens as quickly as possible. And this could be created within a virtual environment, for example, using a general adversarial network or GAN. One AI is employed with creating stronger and more deadly viruses, while the other is employed with combating those viruses against human infection. For example, two weeks ago, I downloaded and played with an app called Plague just to see how pandemics play out on a global scale. I found it doesn't represent entry points very well for some regions like the US or Italy, but overall, the game gives you a very good feel for how things escalate quickly. In regards to the GAN, it may be too difficult now to reproduce all the entry points of the human body and all the kinds of cells that exist in our body to mimic the way the body works, but in theory, and working step by step towards this kind of a solution, it should be on everybody's minds. What we get out of this is a list of possible viruses that could appear in the real world before they even happen, and a list of ways to combat those viruses. The advantage of doing it virtually is that you can't actually create or release these viruses into the real world without having the mechanics of creating them, and which of course is beyond most anybody's capability. But a group of data scientists and developers could potentially create this virtual GAN. I'd be interested to hear feedback about this. And to wrap up and moving forward, what I'd like to do is, if we can sustain this discussion on a daily basis, perhaps mixing it up with some language practice, I'd like to open this up for discussion back and forth between the Glossica community and myself as resident in-house polyglot and founder of Glossica. I'm here to service not only our staff, our customers, but also anybody else in the community. So feel free to communicate with us. And thanks for watching.